Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. The one thing I'll say about Joe, um, I remember him from many years back, my first WISC conference I've ever went to, WISC is usually on the basis of software technology for those who don't go to. I remember those meetings. A new professor kept running up to the microphone after every talk and tried to speak like a killer question. There was a talk that went by on a joke, and he ran up to the microphone and had this killer question. And that leads into the fact that he's an associate professor at the University of Minnesota, but he has so many interests. It's almost hard to introduce him. He's dead in multimedia, CSW. Um, the group Jones project is something he's very well known for, but he dabbles in attention and task switching, and, and he'll tell you more about all his various interests. But he's a really smart guy, it's a pleasure to have him here, so I hope you I will say the WIS community got revenge. <laughs> If you do that often enough, they then ask you to run the conference. And when you run the conference, you realize you can no longer run up to the microphone each time because it looks really bad. And so other people have been taking the microphone, thankfully, yeah, since. I'm not going to talk about anything related to that WIST community. But what I am going to talk about is a set, actually just a pair of projects in this area that I've lumped together as bridging computer science and behavioral science. And these are two collaborative projects, one of which is fairly well underway and moving into a second phase. It's been through three years and going into now a five-year second phase, one of which is just at the end of its first year. And the only two things that these projects have in common are that I'm working on them and that there are people with PhDs in psychology involved. And there's probably nothing else that links them except that I'll in an attempt to close with one slide that links them together, I'll say something that it's good to be collaborative. Uh, you've heard the punchline now. So, oh, wake up. There we go. Um, I'm going to start with the, the more recent stuff. This is a large project in the area of online communities. It's early. It's not as early as the first time I gave this talk, thankfully, when we had zero results. Now we have few results, and few is better than zero. Uh, but we started this in, in last September. It's a five-year project, and I will give you the disclaimer that uh, I have a graduate minor in psychology, which is about the same as saying I've probably read a book or two. And so when I describe psychology, I'm doing it as a computer scientist. And if I get it wrong, forgive me or correct me, and that's all fine. The whole point for this being collaborative is that people like me are ignorant about this stuff, or at least mostly ignorant about this stuff. And so when somebody comes in and talks about theory in psychology, they've already gotten beyond my ability to calculate p-values and run an experiment. So the people involved in this, so that people start to get some credit, uh, at the University of Minnesota, we've got a great group of people whose history and focus is in recommender systems. Uh, my work, John Riedel, who came out of collaborative systems and OS to work in recommender systems. Lauren Terveen, who joined us in uh, 2002 after having a lengthy career at seven or eight companies all in the same office called AT&T Labs, AT&T Research and Bell Labs. Um, and Collaborators at Carnegie Mellon, Bob Kraut and Sarah Kiesler. Bob Kraut, you may know from the HomeNet project. Sarah, if you're in this field, you know from a whole bunch of things ranging from writing to collaboration, both of whom have their background in social psychology. Uh, Yan Chan, an economist at Michigan, and Paul Resnick, who's probably best described as a polymath, who has done everything from privacy to um, protocols to recommender systems. His background is somewhere in between computer science, business, and economics. So it's an interesting um, collaboration. And we've built it primarily around a site we already run called Movie Lens, which is a movie recommender, which enough people have seen a recommender by now that I'm not going to go into the details of it. You rate movies, it comes back, it tells you about good ones. So the goals of this, the sort of lofty goal is, Let's find out how to elicit optimal participation in an online community. 
It's a good idea. The optimal is in quotes because we're not exactly sure what that is. We know it's not just more because there's a lot of work that's out there already that says simply having more people talk in discussions and other things doesn't improve the quality necessarily. You want people to put in the contributions that are needed. You want people to fill the gaps. You want people to put effort into their contributions. Uh, but we do include more because in many cases for things like ratings in a collaborative filtering system, the more ratings you have, the more powerful the system is. If you'd like to steer them, it would be much better to have somebody rate some obscure Japanese animation than to have them rate Titanic again. But it's still better for them to rate Titanic than to rate nothing. And the idea here is there are lots of theories. In fact, so many theories that they often come into conflict as to why people participate in collective activity, why they make contributions to something that has a group good. Almost none of these theories have been tested online, and virtually none of them have been tested in what we call a field experiment, where you go out and set up something and observe the way people react, but you don't bring them into a lab and say, okay, we're going to have a game. Do you cooperate or do you stab the person in the back? Okay, you get 20 points. Next round, what happens? There's a lot of game theory-based economics, and there's a lot of social game experiment psychology that test that got these theories to where they are, but that doesn't let you go out and apply them in a lot of the real world or even the Internet, if you don't call that the real world. So we want to resolve some of these cases where the theories make conflicting predictions, and if we really succeed, the goal is five years from now, we'll be able to write a designer's guide to online communities. A guide that says, here's a whole bunch of stuff, and depending on what you do with this stuff, we can tell you what probably happens. And so when you think about that, there's a whole bunch of design factors. There's the visibility of identity. When do you want people to be anonymous? When do you want them to have persistent pseudonyms? When do you want them to have identities linked to their real world identity? What does that change in the nature of contributions? You know, if you're talking about a community of students that are rating their professors, it's probably the case that you get a very different nature of contribution in those two case extremes. We see this. We have debates in our university all the time over whether the, um, the student discussion websites should be anonymous or not, because when they are anonymous, you have people who almost spam and who flame. And when they're not anonymous, you have people who won't post. And you can see this in any community, and it ties into other issues like status. Do you award status to individuals who contribute in a, in a way that's valuable to the community? Do you award it privately? Do you give the person a pat on the back and send an email message saying, gee, thanks, you've just given us your 500th rating. We're thrilled. Or when their name pops up, do you see star, 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 or a comment, or take your favorite one from Amazon or eBay or anybody else who's doing status? Lots of people are doing this. For all we know, they may even be studying it. I promise they're not publishing it uh, because that's not their mission. What's the structure of a community? The great thing about online is the internal structure of the community and the visible structure don't have to be the same. We could have 60,000 people who all think they're in a community of 100. Does that help? If you have only 100 people, do people feel that there's not enough critical mass to be worth putting effort in? Or do they feel, wait a minute, with 100 people, I can really make a contribution. Whereas if there are a thousand people here, no one will know if I did anything or not. The psychology theories go both ways here. They say you need enough people to succeed. And if you get too many people, then you don't feel your contribution is valued. And there are a lot of these where you want a middle point. How do you deal with diversity, self-awareness? There are a whole bunch of economic structures. Do you bribe or reward people, take your pick for what they do? Do you uh, monetize things? And I'll give you some of the examples of what came out of that work. Uh, there's a lot of theory here, so I've mentioned some of these. Identity tends to lead to accountability. That's sort of a recurring theory, that if somebody can point to the fact that you did it, you're more likely to do something that you don't mind people knowing you did. Um, affinity tends to lead to participation. So if there's something about a group that you like, 
And often there's, there's usually a theory out there that similarity leads to affinity. So if people like you are counting on you, you're more likely to work. On the other hand, uniqueness leads to participation. Uniqueness meaning you have something to contribute that you don't feel everyone else can. So if you've got a discussion group on you know, the Java language and questions and you're an expert who's working developing it, that's a lousy example. Let's try this again. If you're working in a discussion group on C Sharp language and its developments, and you are an expert who's working on the development of the future, you may not respond to somebody who says, how do you do that print thing again? But when somebody comes in and says, I'm not sure I understand what the model is going for garbage collection in the language, you might jump in knowing nobody else can answer that, but other people could have answered the other question. I'm going to have to reverse those when I go, if I go to Sun one day. Start with C Sharp and see what their reaction is. Um, economic theories, there's the basic theory of all economics that says that people maximize their utility, which is a theory that will never be disproven because any time you come up with something that looks like a conflict, they just say that's part of your utility function. So if you say, but, but people are altruistic, oh, that's because you benefit from the happiness of others. You say, but uh, people are, ra are irrational. Well, you get a benefit from certain things that are not directly tied to your utility. It's a strange thing, but it has some meaning, and I'll explain how we used it. There's also things like inequality aversion, which is a theory that says all things being equal, if you discover your participation, actually the way they would say is if you discover your personal utility unrelated to your benefit from others, the stuff you directly get minus the stuff that you contribute is lower than other people's. You're going to try to raise it. And if it's higher than other people's, then you may feel guilty about it and do things to lower it. The way of saying that is if you benefit more from the system than other people, you're willing to put more work in. And if you benefit less than it turns out other people are, you're probably going to be lazy about putting work in and try to siphon off the work of others. So the research model for this stuff, um, I should say one thing about movie lens that we love is we drown in data. And we love having data. We just got over our 10 millionth rating, uh, which is a lot of ratings of movies, given that we have under 10,000 ratings, uh, 10,000 movies in the system. You know, that you can do the math. That's over an average of 1,000, but it's on a very weird distribution curve with, well, not weird, just asymmetric. Uh, with a whole bunch of movies that don't have 100 ratings and a whole, actually a fairly large number of movies that have over 10,000. Um, but so we do everything we can offline first to predict based on historical data, based on reanalyzing historical data, occasionally based on focused experiments, what's going to go on. And then we do the online studies. We've run about six of them so far in the course of the year where we create a variant of our system, go do something in that variant of the system, open it up to three, four hundred users to try it out, and follow them sometimes in the short term, sometimes over the long term. None of the long term ones are done yet. But if we do something and it looks like it has an effect, we can just watch people for the next year or two and look at does it change the amount that they participate, does it change the amount that they consume, and see what happens. And it's a fun way to do studies. Um, I'm going to tell you about a few of them individually. The initial study that was not formally part of this project, but that we did during the phase where we were kicking things off, was about discussions. Uh, this is a study that was published in the last CHI. The uh, lead author was Pam Ludford. And it was a study of participation in discussions with two factors controlled. The similarity of movie tastes of people within the group that was discussing and their awareness of their own uniqueness. There are some interesting confounding factors, as there always are in these types of social studies. But we had eight groups of people, each group of about 30. And each group would have a discussion board. They were not aware that there were other groups. And the discussion boards were not open to anybody but their, that group. Once a week, we would post a discussion topic. And half of the groups had 
people who had fairly high interpersonal correlation on movie tastes. Half of the people had fairly low interpersonal correlation on movie tastes. Half of the groups, properly latticed, got a message with every week saying, by the way, here's something that you have in your profile that nobody else in your discussion group has. So you might get, you know, what's the best love story movie of all time? And I could send you a message saying, did you know you're the only person in the group who rated this movie? Or you're the only person who liked this movie? Or you're the only one who disliked this movie? And I'd give you one fact. All of these were manually generated. This was a fairly labor-intensive study because we did this over many weeks, having people not just design questions, but design a question, see if we could find something unique for everyone. And if we couldn't, we'd go and design another question until we could. And it worked out pretty well, and it was interesting. What we found out was that dissimilarity increased contribution, which is not obviously predicted by the theory that's out there. Some people would think that you want similarity. Some people would say that dissimilarity leads to conflict, which leads to more interesting discussions. Yeah? Did you, in the tradition where you did not make people aware of the uniqueness that you sent? No, we didn't have a control. We had a message. They got the same message that everybody got, but it didn't have a, a replacement clause for it. And one of the things that we know is a confound in there is we didn't give those people an easy contribution. Uh, it might have been interesting if we'd given them a fact about the community as a whole instead of about themselves. And if we do a replication of this, that's probably what we're going to do. And as always, that became immediately obvious right after the study was over. Um, awareness of one's own uniqueness increased contribution. And I, I would say when you take this conclusion here, you have to take it in context. All of these are people who like movies. It's not clear if you had one person who liked movies and one person who hated movies but loved football and that, that that level of dissimilarity would work. But some dissimilarity is good. Awareness of, the, of their own uniqueness increased contribution. In some cases, it was clear from the contributions that they had done exactly what, what your question implied, which is they took advantage of the fact that we said something. Some people even said, the mail I got said I should tell you that and pasted it in. Other people got the uniqueness message and said something else entirely. And we don't have a thorough enough analysis to know that we can isolate those. I don't think we actually have enough data to isolate those. Active discussions, these are the two other things I thought were interesting. People who were previously highly active raters in our system did not necessarily become active discussants and vice versa. Different kinds of contribution attract different people. And participants in this study rated more than a control group that was selected and not put into the discussion study. So we took people who met the same eligibility criteria. They didn't do as much rating as people who were engaged in the process of, rec of uh, reviewing. As you thought about what, or sorry, discussing, as you thought about what you were going to discuss, that led people to go back into the rest of the system and look at movies and rate movies, which is sort of nice. There's some other studies that have followed. Uh, in this area of motivation, we had two projects in a class at CMU, a class taught by Paul Resnick visiting there and Bob Kraut, that have turned into a paper that will be at CSCW this year in Chicago, um, using an email campaign to elicit people to, to rate more. And they basically found two things, both of which were expected uh, based on the theory. If you made people aware of their uniqueness, which they did in a similar way, uh, but they had control messages there, they did increase rating. And if you gave people specific, non-trivial but achievable goals about how much you wanted them to rate, that also increased their rating. There was also a conclusion, though not as strong a conclusion, that went against the theory that said references to benefit actually decreased rating. So if you told people how rating is going to help them, or if you told people about how rating is going to help others, that didn't lead to an increase. In fact, it led to a decrease. We don't know why. But we don't know why a lot of, a lot of things. It's still interesting. And it's the sort of thing that I would, again, say, you want to confirm it before you're sure. I'm going to mention more briefly, yeah. In, in any of these studies, has anyone looked at 
showing the group kind of like that compared to the other groups. Not so it's personally relevant. This has always been personally relevant. And all of the theory that we're basing it on says that it's your individual uniqueness relative to a group that is motivational. But you could, I think there's a different set of theory in when you get into this area of group competition. Yeah. If one group is trying to compete with another group, you can start to get into that. But um, group uniqueness doesn't tie directly into achievement of the task. And so without a theoretical basis, it's probably not something we're going to study. If we found a theoretical basis, we want to go after it. That's one of the most challenging parts of this project is we have lots of good ideas for which there's no theoretical basis to predict one way or another. And it doesn't get us anywhere if we can answer a question that has no theoretical grounding. So to give you three other examples of things that are not yet at the level of being published, some of them are not, are not even half done yet. One we call self-maintaining communities. Movie Lens has had a simple model from its beginning. We've had a guru who adds movies to the database. This guru is a volunteer that none of us have ever met. Uh, yes, Chad, uh, who is a fellow in, I think it's Buffalo, New York, who loves movies. Used to write reviews for us, not movie reviews, but DVD reviews, which are different because you talk about special effects and added features and all that stuff and has been for about six and a half years adding every movie that went into the movie lens system. Ignoring the question of whether Chad could go on forever, which perhaps he could, there's this interesting philosophical question and perhaps practical question. Shouldn't a community maintain itself? provide the content that's its own core. And so we ask the question, what happens if you let the masses start maintaining the database? And we've been trying a couple of different variations, and we're still trying some. But most of them came around the model of somebody makes a suggestion and gets a pointer to the movie that makes it clear what movie you're talking about. So they may give you an IMDb link to this movie. And then somebody else will go through, check whether the movie meets our criteria for inclusion, and add the details for that movie. As a volunteer, we'll go and look up who's the director, what year was it, who are the actors, other people. You could say, why don't you just screen scrape that stuff? But there are enough legal letters we've gotten from Amazon's lawyers about what you can do with IMDb data that we've chosen not to go down that route. Um, all of this has some interesting value because if we could get the community to put in good data, we could have a lot more data. There's a lot of stuff we don't say about movies. We refer people elsewhere because we can't put it all in with one volunteer. And we did various versions of this where one person enters the data and it goes in, or a person enters the data and then a second person checks it, or a person enters the data and then our guru checks it. The results were somewhat messy. People didn't do uniformly good work. And there were a lot of people who just said, eh, forget about actors, directors, just put it in. That's good enough. Um, worse than that, there was some hijacking of suggestions. So we did this in a model where you had to have an existing suggestion for a movie and a second person would put the movie in. People who wanted to put their favorite movie in would take a suggestion. So, you know, somebody comes in and says, I want to put in whatever it is, Sleeping Beauty 1934. I don't know that that's a real year. Um, and someone would say, I'll do that. Oh, but you got the title wrong. The title really was Beaches, and the year really was this, and the director was that, and lo and behold, I got my favorite movie in. We did not see that coming. We probably should have. Our movie guru has gone into some fits. Uh, because of the quality of data that's there, all of which is now being cleaned up by hand. But one of the lessons we got out of this was, if you're going to do this, you need a very robust system that not only, and we saw the same thing, if somebody could enter all the data and the person checking it would just change it all to what they wanted. You need at the very least a mechanism for a system like this that says, if you 
cha check the data and make significant changes, somebody else had better check it again. Uh, and there may be other things that we need to get people to do this. There's certainly not a community ethic around it. Maybe if people signed the data that they entered and said, this was entered by Patrick Bowdish, you'd be more careful about what you put in next time. Not that I know who our anonymous users are, of course. Um, social preference. We're trying to do something that, as far as I can tell, people have not done in a system like this. Build through a combination of, of empirical data gathered from usage and extensive survey data, an economic model of why people use the system, and then use that economic model to influence their behavior by changing some of the parameters of the system to tweak the way it rewards people. This is hard. I have no conclusions to give you. We've spent, well, months, including some focused retreats, working with the economists on this. And you learn a lot in the process. One of the things that you learn is that users of free online sites are highly resistant to your attempts to monetize their value. What I mean by that is, when you ask somebody the question, the question they wanted us to ask is, so how much is it worth for you to have the system in money per year? We eventually came up with a version of that that was a little bit more guarded to avoid making people think we were going to start charging. That said, we have no intention to start charging for the system. Assuming, however, there were no free systems on the internet that did this, what would it be worth per year? And we still got it between a quarter and a third of the people would refuse to answer, many of them writing in notes saying how horrible that idea was. We had five monetary style questions. What would we have to pay you to do certain actions? What would you pay, pay us to get certain benefit? And very few people who would answer all of them, which makes things much more difficult. The direction this is going, though, is fun. Even without that, it looks like we're going to be able to build a utility function for people that in our next step we will be able to give people different messages and different incentives to test some of these theories of how people react to different factors. So are people inequality averse? Um, my own theory and many of the people involved believe inequality aversion is a myth that nobody worries about inequality and equality within a system because they realize that people's lives as a whole are so different. And the fact that somebody here may be getting more value out of movie lens for what they put in than I am, you know, for all I know, that person spending the rest of their life in you know, a, a three by six foot room confined and movie lens is the only joy they get. And should I really begrudge them the fact that they haven't rated as much as I have? We'll find out. You think we should? I think you're kind of touching on that, but couldn't you, instead of asking people what they pay, just ask them how many hours they'd be willing to contribute, somehow figure out their... Actually, we're using that as an empirical measure. We know how long they've been on the system. So you kind of have it. We, oh, we wanted to have two measures of everything. One that they told us and one that they did, so that we could cross-reference to see if they were right. The ones we've been able to cross-reference, people are quite accurate in what they've told us. Many of them we've not been able to cross-reference yet. But yes, absolutely. In the long run, we don't want a survey at all if we can avoid it. If we have to get two or three questions, that would be okay. Because we want to be able to take users who are not in the experiment and we no longer are manipulating them because that implies informed consent, but rather we will have tailored the system so that it personalizes to them the benefits they receive in a way that's reflective of their economic value. The last one is what I would call an educational success but a research failure, at least so far. It's not over. One of the complaints about movie lens from the people on the social side doing research on this was it's not really a social system. You can use it and have no idea that there's anybody else even there. Guilty. So we got a group of people, including people doing design, people from the psychology side, side and, our, and some of our computer scientists to get together and say, let's come up with a whole list of ways we can make it more visible within the confines of the current system. 
So change all the language that talks about the system to talking about the other people that are there. When you log in, have it talk about how many people have been there recently. Have little tidbits about the other people that are there. Make it relatively easy to see how many other people have taken an action that you are about to take. And the theory here would suggest that this will make more powerful the various social cues that would elicit social contribution. We did all that. Had two versions running in parallel. A social version, a non-social version. No detectable difference. It was unfortunate. Now there's two explanations for this and we don't know which one's right. One is people knew it was social, actually three explanations. People knew it was social all along so the queue didn't affect it. We don't believe that because when we've done surveys and we've done interviews of people asking them how the system works, a large number of them have no idea. And we confirm that every time through. There are people who think we sit around and decide which movies to recommend. And I assure you, we don't sit around and decide, but it's hard to reassure them. A second theory is um, that all of this stuff was still insufficient to cue the social response. The third possibility is the fact that it's social didn't change anyone's behavior. And this experiment was by itself not enough to isolate those. So to reflect on this part of what I'm talking about, Jack Carroll, now at Penn State, has been articulating for you know, at least six or seven years that I know of the need for more theory in HCI. And could, I think a big piece of this is there's lots of theory in the disciplines that contribute to HCI. And part of what we think and the reason we're doing this is that the problem isn't a lack of theory, it's that the theory we have isn't accessible. So you know, there's more theory in psychology than anyone wants to learn in a lifetime. Most of which, if you were to pick up the research paper it was, uh, it was published in, you couldn't figure out how to use it as a practitioner. In fact, I'm not sure I could come up with any of it that you could pick, figure out how to use that was written in a psych journal. And this, I think, may be the real problem, is that the theory that's already out there just isn't accessible. And if we can resolve apparent conflicts and develop some design guidelines, you don't have to be aware of theory per se. You can have a handbook that explains what to do. So I'm happy to take any questions people have on this first part because it will be a rather sudden and abrupt shift if, as I move forward. Yeah. That's uh, one possibility of why your social condition didn't have an influence is because your system is inherently not social. It's all about... That's right. It, it could be it's a, it's a system that people think about as personal good, but the surveys we've done as to why people use the system have a substantial component of it that has awareness of the social features, and people who value knowing what other people think about the movies that they're, that they're rating and other things. So at least for some people we have evidence that they think of it socially. But it may be that there's a difference between thinking of it in terms of other people and thinking of it socially. And how you use it. Yes. Uh, amazingly, the more people use the system, the less they use it for the direct benefit of getting predictions out of it. Uh, when we get into our biggest, our most power users, the people with you know, 500, 1,000, 2,000 ratings. Some of them use it to keep a list of the movies they've seen. They think that's sort of handy. Some of them, a lot of them just say they like having a way to express their opinion. And it's true we don't very well distinguish between, because they don't necessarily say, I want to influence others. And we're just doing some design to try to figure out how to set up a good experiment to distinguish between it's expression that matters, and if I were in a closet and I just said out loud, okay, I admit it, I hate Titanic, I'd feel better. Or if I have to express in a place where other people can hear it, then we can't isolate that yet. Yeah? question about how much you think it generalized to other these results that generalize away from just like recommenders or online communities that are so focused around particular tasks? We don't know yet, which is why by the time these five years are over, we want to do a bunch of these again in a different online community setting. Originally, we had a whole bunch of them lined up. 
then our funding was cut 40 percent before we got the money. <laughs> and so we backed out of the commitment to do them, but we are actually in the next few days we're going to be looking at which one we want to go into next. Mm -hmm. And some of that's going to be replicating the work that looks successful here. Some of it's going to start from a different angle. But um, we're pretty confident that we can't put out those kinds of design guidelines until we've gone to at least two somewhat different communities and seen a similar result. Yeah? Are the multiple views isolated documents or can people react to them? Like They're not reviews right. right now. They're just ratings. They're just ratings. Reviews okay. are something we're putting in. We've had we reviews really system forever why. Okay. and no one used them. And so we're going to move to a model of capsule mini reviews that are much smaller, lighter weight, and we should have experiments working on that in the fall to see if we can induce people to contribute in different ways to those and how that depends on whether your identity is part of it. But we don't have those right now. Yeah. Um, I'm still thinking about this thing where you said explaining people about the benefits of the rating for themselves and for others and found that to have a negative impact. I'm wondering if this stuff that John Merlifer was working on, like explanations, stuff like that, if there's a correlation, with, like if there's a connection between the two, could it actually be all, could that also imply that it's kind of negative in general to help to explain or something? Or? No, that work was talking not at all about motivating people to contribute. And it showed that certain explanations helped people make the right decision. Certain ones led them away from the right decision, and certain ones had no effect. Um, this was not explaining. This wasn't walking them through the logic. This was reminding them. This was saying, you know, remember, the more often, the more movies you rate, the more accurate we can provide recommendations to you. And most people believe that from our surveys. But the fact that they believed it didn't influence their behavior in the way we would expect. Is this how you phrase it, or did you say it based on the fact that you rated more, we were able to give you better ratings? It was prospective, not retrospective. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah. Yes. Why don't I take these two more, and then I'll move on, and I'll stick around afterwards. Yeah, how do you, uh, I'm wondering how you plan to determine what an optimal participation is going to be. Uh, for ratings, we can do it. For ratings, we have a separate piece of the project that's primarily around the analytical side that looks at if you're going to contribute something next, what has the greatest value to the community? What's the value to the community of each contribution you've made uh, measured as what would have been the mistakes the community would have made without your contribution that it didn't make with it, minus anything that your contribution did to do differently. If you think of this simply, if you think of a movie decision as a, a yes or no decision, and you know, one model of this is if you get a score above about three and a half, you'll probably go see the movie on a five-star scale. Below, you probably won't, which is what our surveys have, have shown. Um, we can say how many people moved from one side to the other or back. We can even say how many people that we know whether they liked the movie or not would have gotten better or worse recommendations from your value. And so we're doing a lot of things in that space to lead towards optimality. This is not the best domain for, for studying optimality. It's a good domain for studying value. The problem is all contributions have some value. When we're doing things like discussion, you can do things like looking at uh, people's evaluation of contributions, you can look at people's evaluations of discussions, and sometimes you can actually get an assessment that, wow, if you had only not said anything, this would have been a really good discussion. And so now we know that this was more than an optimal amount of contribution. Uh, most of that's very qualitative. I'm curious if uh, anonymity and recognition were used at any point to increase participation or get more response from the so we started with anonymity because when we built the system, anonymity was a way to get people to participate. We have had a facility where people could put in reviews and could put their names in the reviews for years. And we've had one reviewer who's ever used it because it's a lot of effort for the value that you get out of it. And so we think there needs to be a lot more before we can move forward from that. Was the value uh, like, obtained from recognition? Uh, it's hard to tell. 
The person who used our review system the most got value by claiming that he was a reviewer and getting movie studios to send him review copies of movies. <laughs> okay. Well, shifting gears. From movies to disease prevention. It's a sort of natural transition. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a project called MINTS, standing for Men's Internet Study. Uh, you'll understand why there's nothing in the title that actually describes what it's about when you hear what it's about. It's a large project funded uh, by the National Institutes of Health, specifically mental health, uh, working with Simon Rosser, who is a um, psychologist in a medical school in a program in human sexuality focusing on HIV prevention. And so you can follow the trace of that. And it has an interesting mixture of people from statisticians to internet technicians to uh, behavioral scientists to medical people all working together um, as well as a rhetorician. Uh, who focuses on communication in online places. You may know of her, Laura Gorak, who's written a number of books about the rhetoric of the Internet. Um, as well as a bunch of outside experts, people in Latino communities around uh, different parts of the U.S., to study the behavior of U.S. resident men of Latino background who have sex with other men. Why study this group? One, the largest group of uh, people getting HIV in the U.S. is men who have sex with men. That's the term that they're using in the field to get out of the issue of what it means to be gay versus bisexual versus everything else. Um, second, within that group, Latino seems to be the highest risk identifiable ethnic minority with much higher risk than African-American, white, other groups. So the focus here is on risk-taking behavior, but the real interesting focus here, probably the two pieces that come together are, one, can you use the Internet to find out what's going on? And two, now that people are meeting each other on the Internet, what does that do? And to put it in sort of the very blunt uh, version of competing psychological or or, uh, or in this case, it's behavioral theories. There are two theories about internet, based, internet sexual liaisons, which are in perfect conflict. One of which says, look, online sex is safe sex. People get their jollies online, they type at each other, and everything's much better that way because nobody's ever caught a, a sexually transmitted disease from a keyboard. On the other hand, there are studies that traced uh, an outbreak, in this case it was of syphilis in San Francisco, to a local gay men's chat room. And so there's the other theory out there that says, you don't understand. Practicing for sex online is dangerous. It's worse than just meeting somebody in a bar. And the reason it's worse is you have this illusion of safety. You practice online. Nobody online says, oh, wait a minute, I forgot my e-condom. Because you don't need one online. And you've trained yourself not to worry about that when you're in the real world. Turns out we have good evidence that either neither one of these theories are true or they exactly counterbalance. Because neither of these turns out to be the case. But there's some fun stuff in here, particularly in the research methods and some of the lessons. And that's the direction I'm going to go into. And I'll take this in five parts. A look at design and informed consent. Some stuff about data privacy and data integrity. Uh, it feels wrong to talk about a research project without talking about some of what the project learned. So I'll have some lessons and just a slide on what's next. So when we talked about design and informed consent, the issue was how are we going to get people to fill out a long survey. This is a 40-minute, roughly, survey with um, all sorts of personal questions about you know, how often you have sex with how many people and with what protection and all of this stuff that people do not normally feel like telling you. And how are we going to get people to, to do this in a way that's somewhat representative of 
the population. You don't want to find out that people who love to take surveys have this risk behavior. And people who do this kind of work, and I don't know if some of you come from that side of the field, spend an immense amount of effort worrying about sampling. Yeah. The whole idea that these are convenience samples, they're the people who happen to show up, is already considered a threat, as opposed to doing random digit dialing and you only oversample based on the number of phones a person has, which is sort of better. Um, so let me take you through some of these. As we were, oh, I don't think I mentioned this one yet, but I should say, that we also had to deal with the issue of bilingual equivalency. And it was some interesting stuff, because one of the things that is common here is that you translate in, was written, wrote it in English, translated it to Spanish, had Spanish speakers translate it back to English to see if it said the same thing, so that we could understand that. Most of what we did translated well and pilot tested well. There were certain concepts that we could never get to pass the scale that you just could not test in both languages. Uh, there are some very big cultural differences and there's some very big linguistic differences. One of the cultural differences that we had to finesse around is that as we've learned it in the Latino culture, having sex with other men doesn't necessarily make you gay. You're only gay if you're in a non-dominant role. That changed everything. Fortunately, we had experts in the community who, before we even did the translation, said, this is never going to fly. People are going to say no when you want them to say yes. And this stuff gets to be hard. So here's some of the stuff that we did. You know, we started with banner ads. These were ads, actual ads that we ran on gay.com. And they were built around some very key concepts for rapidly attracting people to the study. What's the advantage to you? You earn $20. Why should you trust this? It's the University of Minnesota. It's somebody you can trust. At least some people think you can trust us. Um, and let's have quick, short language, a picture to attract the right people to what we're doing. Now, since it's on gay.com anyway, you would think we'd attract people, but photos draw the eye. And the photo draws the eye right to the beginning of the text, which is how they were all laid out. The leftmost piece of text is always next to the photo. If you click on that, welcome. And you're, you're now here in whichever language you would like. Once you continue, you've selected your language. You don't have to do like an ATM machine says, you know, and say, hey, what language would you like? Just start and everything works fine. That's easy when there are only two of them. And then you have a whole bunch of things here. Give people control. They can enroll if they want to enroll. They can actually read the entire survey before they decide. That's at an extreme of informed consent, but we thought it was important. They can change language at any time. They can also learn about us. We have a bunch of things here. Logo all the time. A lot of information about the people involved in the study because there was a feeling that it was really important to develop that kind of credibility and trust. Interestingly, none of the information by design talked about the sexual orientation of the people involved in the study uh, because it was felt that that was a criterion for decision that we didn't want people to use in biasing their decision. So one of the questions is, how do you get informed consent for an online study? And the key part here is informed. It's easy to get consent. Yet everything we know is people barely read consent forms if you hand them to them in paper. If you talk with them about it, they might ask, answer, ask the questions they have. So we got permission to experiment with step size chunked consent. So after they got through a quick uh, welcome, they would go through, they would do quick eligibility screening because we don't want to waste their time if they didn't make it through the eligibility screen. All yes, no questions most of which were cross-referenced later so that we could see if somebody lied there. Uh, and then got them things one at a time. And you know, what will I be asked to do? If you do this, here's what you're going to be asked. I understand I will be asked questions about my sexuality, drug use, and related issues. I'm cool with that or whoa. This is all built around the rhetorical work here. People read non-linearly. 
You can't say, I agree with the above, because they may not have read the above. That statement that they agree with, if they read that, you're pretty much okay that they knew what they were getting into. Things are primarily in bullets. They're in short uh, text because nobody reads these long things. And they're in larger text because they're on, they're on a screen. And so you get a whole bunch of these. There's a large amount of white space to say, don't waste your time over here. Come on and read. And the visuals, again, lead them to the beginning of the text. And we did this in an FAQ style where it's question, answer, question, answer. And this is all sort of the short version of that. What are the risks and benefits of participation? Here we couldn't summarize it, so it's I understand the benefits and risks for the study as outlined above. If your eye goes there first, you now say, oh, I guess I have to go up. Will I be identified? It's confidential. Only an email address will be used. If you wanted to, you can get more information about confidentiality. We actually protected the subject data not only technically but through legal mechanisms by getting a certificate of confidentiality that lets us, in theory at least, fight subpoenas and other things for this data. Uh, we also gave them a whole bunch of information on what you could do to deal with the things we can't solve for you. If somebody's looking over your shoulder, there's no technical solution of encryption that stops somebody from looking over your shoulder. So all sorts of things about, you know, quit the web browser when you're done. Uh, you might want to use a web anonymizer so that there's no record of your visiting the site in your browser, and there may be no record of visiting the site from your local host, a whole bunch of stuff like that all of which came after the point of saying, if you can't trust these mechanisms, you might not want to do this survey or at least do it from where you are. And, you know, there's no catch. I don't actually understand why you would ever tell somebody there's no catch, because if there was one, wouldn't you say the same thing? Uh, but that one wasn't mine. Uh, how do I get more information? So I've told you all of these summaries, so I'm not going to take you through it more. There's another issue here that we have trouble with, which is how do you make sure the person who consented was the same person who was informed or was the same person who took the study? And we didn't get into all of this, and that's stuff that has to be dealt with in the future. So second, some context. This is politically sensitive stuff. You know, this study or one of its follow-ups was on the list that came out of Congress of, hey, why are you funding this junk? Uh, previous studies in this group have been protested in various ways. We were very concerned about hackers. We were concerned about a mad influx of people trying to undermine the work. You know, what happens if some talk radio host says, suck all their money away, everybody go in and get their $20 from this thing right now before they can gather any data from you know, people who don't deserve that $20. Um, we didn't get much of that, which is good. We also deal with extensive open record laws in our state. If you really want to, you are legally entitled to walk up to the general counsel of my university and say why you want all of my email. And I have to prove piece by piece that if there's anything in there that you can't have. Otherwise, you get it all. That seems a little bit, I guess in theory, I'm about as vulnerable to the citizens around as you are to your boss. You might actually have more protection from your boss, which gave us a lot of concern. And so we had to go to a bunch of things. So part of this was we had these two goals, well, two key goals and then more. We needed to protect subjects. Even knowing that somebody participated could cause somebody to lose a job, lose a wife who didn't actually know that the subject was doing things on the side, lose um, friends, colleagues, be marked publicly as out or, or HIV positive or other things. We needed to protect the, date, the integrity of the data. One of the principles in human subjects review is that you balance risk against benefit. If we didn't get good data out of it, it wasn't worth putting anybody at any risk. Beyond that, we added the need to provide payment delivery because you don't get people to fill out a 40-minute survey for free usually, as you'll see in a minute. 
<laughs> and to protect the investigators against knowledge that they might be asked to testify at in court. So it was primarily not the senior people who had any access to any of the data. Um, there's some trade-offs that are important here. Anonymity versus inducements are always a trade-off. It is nearly impossible to pay somebody in a meaningful way and anonymously, as we've learned, for good and for bad. Similarly with data integrity, if you have to show your ID to fill out the survey, it's really hard to fill it out five times. And there's also this issue of ease of operation versus security. If your security is too cumbersome, people bypass it. Uh, and so a couple of simple examples here. I'm going to go to ones that might be particularly interesting here. Mm. Okay. So things like protection against monitoring. Obviously, we dealt with security. But the big things that we focused on were how do you get the fact that you were here out of your web browser? That's hard. It is really hard to get even the most popular web browser, let alone browsers, to forget that you came to our site. And we did as much as we could to advise people about clearing caches, about other things. We ended up telling them about how do you go create an anonymous email account so that this account can exist just for the study. A lot of things like that. We provided a lot of payment options, check, PayPal, charity, no payment, whatever people wanted there. We picked the charity. That was easier. We found one that was a Latin American uh, charity working in care of people with AIDS. Um, this is all stuff that you've got there. We had detailed protocols for telephone and email inquiries, things to prevent people from spoofing us. So if you called up, you would hear University of Minnesota Medical School. Then you come back and say, oh, um, I was uh, filling out your, your survey, and I lost my uh, name and password. Can you give it to me? Oh, which survey? We have many surveys here. Why? Because we don't know that you were the person who did this. The last thing we want to say is, oh, you mean the, sub the survey about gay sex? Ah, thanks. That's what I was wondering. You know, there's a lot of stuff you have to protect people against, and a lot of staff training in this. Uh, Multi-part validation. I think I'll just show you the data for this one. This is fun. We had 47 and a half million banner ads displayed. I'll take you down to the final big number, which is 1,026 valid surveys that we analyzed at the end. We only paid for, I think, about 4 million banners. But the way the market is now, buy one, get 10 free just about. Uh, they just run extra ads. We got 33,000 click-throughs. Now, remember, we couldn't restrict the banner ads to Latinos. So that really dropped our click-through rates. We got 33,000 people to click through to see the study site. We got 1,742 of them to enroll in the survey. They volunteered. They fulfilled the eligibility criteria. 58 went through that far and stopped before answering one question. 534 of them started but didn't finish. In a couple of cases, the same person started more than once and didn't finish. 1,150 of them finished surveys, five of which were invalidated because of evidence of either non-Latino identity or non-U.S. residents. They said they were. Then later, when you ask them for the specifics, you know, I'm sorry, there are not very many Latinos with a Swedish father and a, you know, and a Polish mother and who spoke English growing up. And we would check, we would cross-check that data. Um, two with evidence of non-U.S. residents. If you ask us to send your payment to France, you're not Latino in the U.S. You might be Latino in France. And the one that really jumped at us, 119 surveys we had to throw out because they were the second or later complete survey from the same subject. 18 subjects submitted complete repeats. 54 of them from 17 of those and 65 from one subject. We term subject naught. You can think naughty or zero or whatever you'd like. Or, uh, patient zero is the, the, the analogy here. That was scary. Did the analysis afterwards, and a bunch of conclusions could have gone the other way if you cut that data in. 
which is particularly scary. So how did we detect these people? It turned out that PayPal sent us more of a paper trail than we knew. And so when we sent to 65 different email accounts, the person cashed, well, we didn't send to 65. We sent to about 30 of them before we caught the person. And the person cashed those 30 all in the same account, forwarding the payments. Some of them came out of the IP address range. Turns out they were all um, machines in the same campus library of a particular university, but not the same machine. Time to completion. This person finished the survey reliably with internally consistent answers at eight minutes a pop. We didn't know you could finish it with eight minutes a pop at random. And, and the amazing thing is we could, this person didn't val validate any of the internal consistency checks. You know, whatever they said, and they weren't the same answers each time, but they were always consistent, which is amazing to us. And yes, it would have mattered. Okay, last pieces, so some results. In case you're wondering, of Latinos in the U.S. using gay.com who filled out this survey, 84% chose to fill out the survey in English. That's probably not surprising for an Internet population. 16% did it in Spanish. Um, the vast majority, you know, 60% of them basically wanted a check. PayPal got the next biggest chunk, 29%. Charity got 11%. Just keep the money was not a popular alternative. Charity, we did not send their name to the charity, so it was a perfectly anonymous solution. Uh, someone's doing analysis of completion and found that people who said none or charity were much less likely to complete the survey than people who wanted the money themselves, which is an interesting thing. In the future, we may not offer the charity option because of the bias it induces in completion. Age of people in this category your mean is at 28 years old. Actually, is that the mean or the median? I think it's our median is at 28 years old. Uh, you can see the standard deviations. You can see the pattern. Young people, but not extremely young people. You still have pretty good numbers right out into the late 30s, early 40s. Hello. Oh, there we go. What do people use the Internet for? Two slides to compare. How many hours do you spend on the internet each week for work or education? Most common response, none. But you get pretty good responses out to about 10 hours. How many hours do you spend each week using the internet for sex? There's still none, but now 10 hours is the most common response. And pretty good numbers up to 10 hours, then you hit a peak at 20, hit 15, 20. People don't always put in numbers that are unround. But you still get significant numbers out at 30 and 40 hours a week. It's a full-time job. Not a full-time job here, but otherwise. How about personal activities? You're back in the lower numbers again, but a little bit more than you have for work. This one shocked me. How many different male partners, sexual partners, have you had in your lifetime? It's the one out here that's over 1,500, the couple over 1,500 that were just amazing. And I assume this was just bad data, but they're similar to what other studies have shown, which is a shock. On the other hand, very few female partners. You do get one out at 100 as their peak, but that's one person, and your next one is at 50 one at 25 or uh, one or two at 25 and mostly at zero or one two three four um, here's where the real key results came in which is the number of part male sexual partners you met online and not online in the last three months and the short version of it is the hard graph to read is people met twice as many sexual partners online as they did not online turns out they had twice as much unsafe sex on, with people they met online as not online. So the punchline is, you don't take more risk, you don't take less risk, you take the same risk multiplied over more people. And in this field, the measure of sexual risk is number of unique people rather than to, no total number of encounters, and therefore you double the risk because you can meet people more easily. Oh, wake up.
Uh, one last slide, lying. We asked people about on, people they meet on the internet and in real life what they lie about. So almost 65% of people admitted they lied about their name or phone number on the internet, whereas only a, a little over 40% did in real life. A lot more lying about your body on the internet, but there's a good reason for that. I mean, on the internet, I'm 6'8 and blonde, and I can't get away with that here. Um, about twice as much lying about one's genitals, not much more lying about one's relationship status, uh, one's sex, almost no lying and almost no difference about the serious stuff, particularly HIV status, or at least they won't admit it in an online survey, but given everything else they've admitted, I think that's interesting. Now we don't know, if, I don't have the correlational information to, to know is it because they simply withhold the information and they don't lie? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you are negative, you probably wouldn't lie that you're positive, right? So 8% lying, how does this correlate to the number of people infected? I mean, if 8% are infected... The largest percentage that we have are people who say they don't know. And so the honest answer there is, I don't know. I think I'm negative, but I haven't been tested. And so, how they interpreted this question is a really good question. Um, okay, what next? We got five more years worth of money for doing this to go do the next step. I think the next step is sort of fun. We're going to replicate this across all U.S. ethnicities because you want to understand if this is still a real problem and how broad, widespread it is. And then we're working to develop an online, interactive, multimedia intervention to help the people who are interested in reducing risk, which is a fairly large number of them, do so. There's already an in-person program that does this. It's a program called Man to Man where they've been running seminars in Minnesota for, I don't know, eight, nine years, I think, um, where they bring people in and basically take them through rehearsal of preparing to live a safer and more fulfilling life. And all sorts of things from rehearsal of how do you negotiate for safety when you may not be in a position of power to changing your life in general. And the real question we're gonna come up with here is there's three alternatives we wanna compare. We have data on face-to-face, -face, but face-to-face -face is expensive. So what we wanna compare is what if we do nothing what if we give somebody the same amount of time and take them through a curriculum of self-study of the materials that are already out there? Take them to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Take them to a bunch of the various sites that provide good information for people on avoiding HIV and AIDS. And what if we give them something that's interactive and modeled on some program that works? and follow people for 24 months to see if their risk-taking uh, decreases and their sexual health increases. In five years, I will be happy to come back and tell you what happened. Uh, in two or three years, I can probably demo it for you uh, and not tell you what happened. But I think this is some interesting stuff. Uh, if you are interested in this study, I would encourage you to contact Simon Rosser directly. You can actually just search for Simon Rosser. I don't know why we bother with email addresses anymore. You should just have, you should just mail to name at Google and they'll do a Google search and send it to the first person, right? Should work. 80% of the time. 20% of the time you bother John Smith and you get the wrong one. Um, the conclusion, as I said, there's not one that wraps this together except for the fact that doing this work is hard. But there are important problems out there that won't happen if we don't get the technology side people working with people who are trying to deal with these important problems but don't have the facility with the technology to move forward with it. And, um, and I think it's important to do that sort of stuff. So I'm happy to take your questions. You're looking puzzled. <laughs> no? 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.